All right, guys, welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host, as always, Evil Eddie from Pure Evil and May, MyMMANews.com. And with me, once again, is James Sweeney. What's going on, James? How you doing? Yeah, I'm good, thank you, mate. Yeah, I'm just here, just chilling out. I just come home from the gym and about to hit this number two podcast and uh, see if we can make it to number one. Uh, I'm not happy that we made number two. I want, I want the best download, not, not number two. We've got to make number one. So let's uh, let's make this one a good one. So just to update everybody, yeah, James is, is, is letting everybody know that our last podcast has been the second most downloaded podcast on history in uh, the last three months. So let's try to get that up there. I'm looking forward to what we have in store for everybody today because the Ultimate Fighter Season 27 is coming to a close. And there's no one better to talk about some of the best memories that went in the tough house than James McSweeney. And that house is now on the market. So we're going to get to that. Later on in today's show, also Rashad Evans retiring. We're going to have James talk about that and share some of his favorite memories that he shared with Rashad. I'll share my favorite moment that I've seen in Rashad in the last uh, you know, decade, really. And also, we are going to be giving our predictions for Stipe versus DC. But first things first, James, you know, I'm doing this podcast right now with a, literally a piece of my ass rotting. And that sounds disgusting, but I got bit in the ass by a brown recluse spider here on the East Coast. And it's, it's literally eating away at my my flesh. Like It's rotting my flesh away. It's disgusting. So, yeah, are there any crazy bugs in Thailand? Yeah, they're everywhere. I mean, fuck, everything out here can kill you. There's king cobras. We've got brown snakes, spiders. You've got everything out here that can kill you. So you've got to be real careful. But I swear to God, that's the, my – if I find it in my house, I leave, I burn the house to the fucking ground, and I go straight to the airport because <laughs> snakes and spiders – and my, I'll fight King Kong, but I'm not going against a snake or a spider. That's my, that's my Achilles heel. So that's so weird. Oh, that's so yeah, funny. I'm petrified of them. So fuck it, I'll be gone. But you're like no. you're like Indiana Jones being afraid of snakes. Like these big brave guys are afraid of little tiny things. <laughs> They're disgusting. And over here, like they found one at the school. It was only a python, but this python was six meters long. Jeez. So what it did was a lady called up and said, my drains are blocked. So when she looked, she saw there was a snake in it. So they called the snake guy. So when the snake guy turned up, he had to call back up because he, it, it got so big, it filled the drain. It just laid in the drains in the sewers and ate as many rats as it could. And it got so fat, it got stuck. They had to get an, uh, a JCB, one of those big diggers from the street, with a big rope round its neck and they had to drag it out. And it took like 30 people to hold this thing. Oh, my like, God. It's got a picture of it. Yeah, six meters. That's, that, that is disgusting. Something like that is – that that's that's some that's scary that. shit. Shit myself. Do you know what I mean? They found one the other day by the waterfalls was trying to eat a dog and all the time. The ties are not scared of snakes whatsoever. They'll drag them out. They'll pull them. They'll wring their neck. They'll eat them. They'll do anything. And there was like 10 Thai people trying to pull this cobra, um, cobra off of this dog. Wow. They got it off it. The, the cobra didn't bite the dog, but it was attacking the dog like it was going to kill it. So it happens to you all the time. But thank God, where I live is a bit more civil, so I don't get the <laughs> I'd have moved ten times over if it had happened already. So fuck that. So James, it's International Fight Week once again. The Ultimate Fighter season twenty-seven is coming to an end, and we're going to find out how these guys do inside the octagon. You know, going back reminiscent. Do you remember what that vibe, that feeling felt like during this week when? When you were going in there against, you know, the, that season of Rampage versus uh, Rashad? Yeah, I mean, it's it's, a, it's an amazing feat. I mean, could you imagine where MMA would be if it wasn't for the Ultimate Fighter show? Because if you look back, I mean, the UFC was really struggling back then until Forrest Griffin and... Um, and Bonner. And, and Bonner pretty much, you know, reinvented and saved UFC, really, because the people then tuned into that Ultimate Fighter series. It's just gone from strength to strength. I mean, could you imagine where MMA would be without them? It may no. not be here. It may not be here. So the Ultimate Fire is such a big part of the sport. And to be honest, when I was a part of it in season 10, and it was, it was really nostalgic because it was just being a part of history, I guess, and being a part. I mean, of course, we weren't, I'm not Forrest Griffin or Stephen Bonner by no means, but it was just a part of, you know, your name is going to go down in that list and, and you're going to be a part of that history of that number system. And, you know, so many great fighters have come out of that, of, of that. And then just having that feeling of I'm this close to getting my dream come true. You know what I mean? Being a part of the UFC, getting that contract, you're this close. You've gone through all of that stuff and now it's the time. 
So, yeah, everyone's on edge. It's an amazing feeling, but it's a very edgy week, a very mentally edgy week. You've got, really got to keep your mind about you. Don't get, you know, people say about UFC jitters, but it's more about having the pressure and all the people overwhelm you, you know. Nick, can you really... You just want to go on fight, right? Can you explain a little bit to everybody what the UFC, uh, the contract is if you win the Ultimate Fighter? Because don't they kind of tie you down with that if you win? Like that you kind of get paid peanuts in the long run? Yeah, well, it's not so much peanuts, but, it, well, I mean, listen, yeah, it depends what people say. Everyone, some people out there class a million dollars as peanuts. I mean, it's not a million dollar contract. Let's get that straight. It's a six figure contract over two years. And um, and to be honest, yeah, yeah, once you're on it, I mean, most people that don't get the actual six-figure contract, don't get the actual winning contract, they usually go for like eight and eight, 8,000 to fight, 8,000 to win for the next two years. Um, and if you've lost a fight during those two years, it's usually an excuse for the UFC to say, we'll extend your contract, but we'll keep you on the same money. And it, 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 we've seen it over the years that hasn't really evolved. The, the guys who are winning the Ultimate Fighter aren't getting much of a better contract than, than any previous year. But the one thing that is really exciting is that these guys have a chance to open up the career. And that's what is the main focus of International Fight Week. So going back, what, what were you about well, to say, James? Well, the thing is about, about the contract. Yeah, it's not the most biggest financial contract on its own. But if you look at like someone like Roy Nelson, look what he did with it. You know, he moved on, up the ladder, he won, knocked people out, got lots of winning bonuses, lots of knockout of the night bonuses. He really shunned and, you know, become a crowd pleaser and he made a big brand off it and earned millions of dollars. So the contract on its own, yeah, it's not the best, but what the contract brings with it, the sponsors that it brings with it, the the appearances, the, the just the actual ultimate fighter winner. That brings a lot of finance with it and a lot of recognition. So it's not so much the contract. The UFC is smart. They know that, but they know what it brings. Yeah, and you know, with a lot of these younger guys, I mean, Roy Nelson was so well known back then, but you're also taking a chance with a lot of these younger guys who, you know, this season especially, they're all undefeated, but they all have like four, five wins, maybe six wins. So, you know, uh, maybe that contract is fair. I mean, from fighter to fighter. But there is a sad note here, James. Uh, Ultimate Fighter House is, is going up for sale. I mean, well, how do you feel about that? I couldn't give a shit. <laughs> no, I mean, listen, it's a, at the end of the day, it's coming to an end. So the UFC bought that house clearly to use it as they wish. They've obviously, whoever's going to buy that house, it'll probably be some rich fan somewhere is going to buy that house because they want to say they own the house. Pretty much like somebody buys a house from any actor or film star or sports uh, person they want. You know, they're gonna, that house is a nice house in Vegas. It's a big house. Uh, you know, it's a lot of history there. The house has been ripped to shit over the years. <laughs> I'm sure it's been redecorated and they've had to strip all the wires and all the cameras out and have it redone and, and they'll put it back on the market. Um, yeah, someone's gonna buy it. I mean, to, for me personally, I never, I lived in Vegas and I never went back to that house once to have a look. <laughs> so I'm not really attached to stuff like that. I'm more attached to the situation. I don't think most parties would actually give a shit if they sold the house. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's just interesting. It's just, I guess it's just a nail in the coffin of, you, know, you know, it's definitely finishing. You know what I mean? So people are probably more upset or more, a little bit down about that rather than the house being sold. I mean, who, the house is a house, isn't it? You know what I mean? So it's not that big a deal. But um, yeah, I mean, it's coming to a close. And I don't know what this means for MMA. I mean, I don't think MMA is going to suffer from it. But if you look how many superstars have come from the armor fighter, so many, right? And now so many are retiring. I mean, just there's a whole new chapter. So before before we talk about some of the some of the amazing stars like Rashad Evans that have came out of it, like you, um, you know, what was your favorite memory of the Ultimate Fighter House? <laughs> going in and then leaving. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when we first go in, we were so excited to be there. And of course, it's all like, you know, it's your, it, all the cameras and all the people. And, you know, you get to order any food you want. And, and you know, you get to do, you know, you have a bit of fun and do whatever. But then, like, midway through, you know, you're training every day, twice a day hard. Sunday, there's no training. There's nothing to do. You're just sitting around day after day doing nothing. Like, no phones, no nothing to read, no books, no magazines, nothing, just interaction, you know. So, 
extremely boring on some time. So that halfway through that week three, week four, it's very monotonous trying to find things to do. And that's why people start getting mischievous and start joking around and fucking around. I mean, don't forget the show was designed by a psychologist, right? So it's, it's designed for you guys to interact and to mentally probably go a bit immature because, I mean, fighters, we're all a little bit crazy at the best of times. You know, if you go on a, a guy's night out with 10 of your friends, you all get drunk, you all act a little bit juvenile you all do stupid things and joke around you don't act like you know the 40 year old father that you are you go out and have a bit of fun right yeah so if you stick them all in the house with unlimited anything they want food drink you name it unlimited nothing to do in vegas they're like they can see the las vegas strip from their room but everyone's having a good time and party and all the coaches are coming to you like hung over like, Oh, we had such a great night last night. You will leave what we did and this girl and that girl and this thing and that thing. And then like, you're just stuck in your room all night, just staring at each other. You know, eventually when you do get a chance to have a little bit of a laugh and a bit of fun, you try to do it. So, I mean, this night I made some good, it was, a, it was an amazing experience. It's an experience in my life that I'll never forget. So, you know, it's easy to say, yeah, it sucked at the time. But you know what? Yeah, it was a truly a blessing for me in my career. It was truly a blessing to be introduced to the American public in MMA. And no one, I'm, I'm just from a small town in England. Like, no one knows me. So to be introduced into that world and, and just thrown into that level and got a chance to do what I did, it, it's, it's an amazing, it's an amazing opportunity. You look at it on the big picture. Everyone can joke about it and say what they want, but... You know, it, it, it truly is an amazing thing, and um, I'll always be forever grateful to the UFC for it. Well, you were telling us that Rashad actually is the one that helped you get into that house, you and Brandon Schaub, uh, for that season of Ultimate Fighter. And now, here we are, man. Uh, Rashad Evans has retired. He's had an amazing career. There's been three champions this year that have retired. But I think the most important out of, out of all three of them, you got to realize that two of those guys were on the Ultimate Fighter. You had Michael Bisbang on the Ultimate Fighter, and then Rashad Evans as well. Two champions that came from this show. Uh, you know, what were your favorite Rashad Evans moments? I mean, there's so many of them between, uh, you know, the Chuck fight or the Brad Iams fight or even looking all the way down to the Forrest Griffin fight where you were actually in the corner. Um, to be honest, I cornered Rashad for three or four different fights. Um, of course, the first fight was for the world title against Forrest Griffin. Um, that's how I we actually initially met. I was brought over as a sparring partner, um, being the same kind of size as Forrest and a striker and everything else. And then um, pretty much friend friended up with Rashad and we trained together every single day. I went to I wasn't just a sparring partner. I went to his conditioning with him. I partnered. Him. I pretty much did exactly the same as he did for his camps, um, because of course camp can be a lonely place and it means you've got to go condition on his own. He's got to go wrestling on his own. He's got to go to striking on his own. So I pretty much was his training partner for all of it, and um, I was in his corner when we won the belt, and uh, that was an amazing moment. Um, there, there was many amazing moments um, for Rashad and I when we first met, and, and also just to see him as an athlete grow. Um, when he won the belt, he became very um, confident in himself and, and he was great to watch because Rashad is always a flamboyant, funny, go lucky character. And, you know, there's a there's certain level of humbleness about him and there's a certain level of cockiness about all fighters. But there was also a certain level, a little bit of insecurity too sometimes. And then he was being coached through that. Whether he knew it or he didn't, he was being coached through that. And a lot of compliments going his way. A lot of people feeding him compliments. And then when he won the belt, it gave him justification for that. And he really, truly believed in himself a lot more. And um, And that was something really special to watch because he's a very talented fighter. Um, extremely talented, great wrestler, um, and, and he started to excel. I mean, it was a shame uh, when he fought Machida, the way that fight went. Um, there's numerous factors of, of why that fight went wrong. Um, but watch him prior to that, I mean, when he fought when he fought Forrest, that was picture perfect. When he fought Rampage, that was a great fight. You know, there was a lot of good fights in his career. So, he is, you know, it's a shame the way his career went towards the end. But there's a lot of highlights in his career as well that um, don't, don't overshine the, the darkness towards the end. I think my favorite moment was when he beat Chuck Liddell, man. I think that's the moment that sticks in a lot of people's minds. Because you're looking at Chuck Liddell, you don't think he's going to be stopped. And then here comes Rashad Evans. And bam, right, right when you don't think 
that Chuck Liddell is gonna gonna lose another fight or or, or get knocked out. Boom. It's like taking nothing from Chuck. I mean, I mean that was an amazing knockout for sure. Rashad knocked him out cold, and that was an, an immense knockout. It was really bad. It was a beautiful punch. He threw the overhand right as he was backing away. Chuck was pressuring him. He threw the overhand right and left hook, and the left hook missed because Chuck had gone. And um, it was re- what was really bad was that no one, the only few people picked up on it, but somebody close to the microphone of the commentator said, Chuck's dead. And it caused uproar across the whole network. It caused absolute uproar across the network because it went live. It wasn't the commentary team, but somebody close to them <gasps> said, Chuck died, Chuck's dead. And of course, everyone across the world heard it. So there was reports that Chuck died. It was really bad. Like you can imagine. And of course, he was, he was, and he was okay. Um, it was great timing for Richard to fight Chuck. Chuck's an absolute legend. It was great timing, but nothing taken away from Richard. It was a great victory. And that was one of the highlights of his career, I think, for him. I think there's a few highlights for him, and they were just milestones when he fought Tito that was a great fight for him too because I remember him saying to me after that Tito was the strongest person he ever fought uh, physically the strongest the best wrestler extremely strong and um, <clears throat> they had a great rivalry too they didn't like each other either I actually remember us meeting in a nightclub once and Tito was there and them two had words and we actually all jumped up Tito's crew jumped up. I jumped up. There was all of us standing up staring at each other. We got, almost had a fight in um, Excess Nightclub in, in Las Vegas. That's crazy. So, uh, yeah, there would have been a, it would have been crazy. There was about 20 of us. There was like eight or nine from our side and about 10 or 15 from Tito's. And it would have been like 25 fighters in the UFC all kicked off <laughs> in Las Vegas. That stuff uh, still I, happens I, nowadays. I mean, the Diaz brothers, Mike Perry. I mean, what's... Tito and Richard stood up on like a on a table, like on a bench near each other, and it was getting burnt. So I picked up a metal ice bucket full of ice, <laughs> and I thought I was going to smack him with the ice with the metal ice bucket. And um, everyone was everyone just started getting up and picking up bottles and champagne bottles and chairs and all sorts. And it was like it was about to go, but uh, thankfully it didn't. It got it got deployed and uh, nothing happened and it calmed down. But um, they didn't like each other for a long time. Every time Richard and Rampage would see each other in public. There would always be another fight or an argument. It was going to go off. Seems like they sort of their beef now. But, I mean, listen, you know, to me, Rashad was my friend back then. And um, we went through something together. He was excelling in the UFC as a champion. I just got into the, uh, into the, into the UFC. We trained together. We were from the same gym. And um, if we're both honest, it never was the same again once we left Albuquerque. And, uh, you know, two young guys with big egos, eventually we went our separate ways and it didn't work. But I've always wished him nothing but the best. And um, he had some amazing moments. I'll always be thankful because um, I don't think he got me in the UFC, but he definitely, definitely helped between him him and Greg Jackson. They both played a huge part in getting me in. And uh, it changed my life, you know what I mean? So um, there was some great part. I mean, there was one memory I had at Richard's 30th birthday. Um, he had a surprise birthday party thrown by his wife and uh, I was the only person invited that wasn't a family or friend <laughs> and they threw me in privately and then we had a big surprise weekend in, uh, in Chicago and we had a great weekend and it was just a real good fun weekend you know with all the family and friends it wasn't about fighting it was just about being friends and uh, we had a really amazing time and that was some of the best memories for me was some of the stuff we did outside of the UFC like me and Richard was in Albuquerque together we lived in the same house with um, a good friend of ours John and uh, we would just go out and catch a movie or we'd just go out and get some dinner and just have a laugh just driving around and you know just talking crap and just just laugh you know what I mean and it was just like that friendship or, or, or normality was really cool we used to just have a good time, a good fun time. And uh, that was really great back then. So m- most of my memories of him were on a personal level rather than a business level of his fights. He, he, he went on to make, you know, huge waves in the UFC. And uh, he, I think he deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. I think he, he, he did a, a great thing for the sport and for himself. And, you know, I think he did his part. And uh, I'm sure he will be one day because I know Dana thinks very highly of Rashad. Um, yeah, so most of my personal best times come from that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, uh, it's a shame 
how it finished. But uh, I respect his decision. I think it's a smart move. I think it's the right decision for him to retire. And you know what, James? He's had such an amazing career. If we could pick one fight to tell the audience that they should go check out, if they haven't ever seen a Rashad Evans fight, what would be your number one fight? I already said Chuck. Um, that that was mine. What what would be your favorite fight of of Rashad best, Evans' career? Best performance that he ever did was when he beat Forrest. I think that was just because a he stuck to the game plan like not absolutely perfect. B he implemented the striking with his wrestling. And uh, when he took him down and ground and pounded him, I thought it was almost perfect to come for what we trained. For me, that was picture perfect, the best Rashad Evans I ever saw. So I would always recommend that one for people, to be honest. So moving forward here, kind of a good segue since we're kind of talking about, you know, Tito Ortiz and Rashad Evans and, and going at one another and Chuck Liddell. Well, Chuck versus Tito 3 was just announced uh, earlier on today, James. <laughs> <laughs> and it's going to be by Oscar De La Hoya Promotions. Yeah, well, what's your thoughts on this? I mean, this is this is kind of crazy. I mean, you got Chuck Liddell, man. What is he, 51 years old now? I mean, it's not so bad for Tito because Tito stayed active. And Tito's had some half-decent fights in Bellator and stuff like that since then. With Chuck, I think Dana summed it up correctly. I mean, no one should be fighting at 50. Chuck is an, was an amazing fighter, and I'm sure he's still, in his mind and technical wise, he's still amazing. I'm sure he's going to get himself in great shape. But the fact of the matter is, there's there's some things that you can't control. Your health. There's the brain factor, the age. The, you just can't control that. And Chuck hasn't lived the clean life. Chuck's had a very big party life for many years. Go in hand in hand with him being an athlete. Being an athlete. So... Um, I'm, I'm I'm interested to see, but I'm not interested to see. Do you know what I mean? Like I just don't want this to start being a reoccurring fashion that now all of a sudden such and such is going to pop up out of, out of the blue. I mean, people were frowning about it when Randy Couture was fighting in his 40s. Mm. But Randy was champion. Randy was a clean guy that never did drugs, never smoked, you know, was doing triathlons and uh, and just on 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 the daily, just for fun, you know what I mean? Just on his day off, he would go and do a triathlon. The guy was an absolute fantastic um, condition expert, and he got into the game very late. Chuck got into this game very early and had wars. I mean, you can see Chuck at the end of his days um, getting quite chinny, right? He got knocked out quite a few times. I mean, don't forget, Ch uh, Rashad beat him, Keith Jardine beat him, Rampage beat him. Um, didn't Wanderlei knock him out too? Yep. Rand, Randy Couture knocked him out. I mean, that's quite a lot of knockouts for someone who had a chin like granite, which led him to, which led him to, you know, retire. Ten years later, I can't see that getting any better. Yeah, this time around, I think Tito Ortiz is kind of like, you know what? Even though I've had all these surgeries, this is a good fight for me to return on, if any. And you know what, Chuck? him because I mean the last time they fought Chuck kicked the, sh kicked the shit out of him mm -hmm. do you know what I mean and and all the smack talk in the world and Chuck beat the absolute granny out of him and to be honest Tito's been on any hot every single highlight reel of knockouts ever since that <laughs> you know anytime yeah. you want to see someone getting beaten down you see you know Chuck sta uh, uh, Tito standing like this and Chuck just wailing and embalming and knocking him out do you know what I mean? So I'm sure Tito wants recognition for that. And he doesn't give a fuck if he's 50 years old or 100 years old. You know, he'll take that fight. Plus, it's going to be a great payday for them both um, just because of all the old time sake of, of MMA. I just think it's unhealthy for the sport. That's all. Well, what do you think about it? Because it's not at Bellator. It's not in the UFC. It's Oscar De La Hoya doing it, which makes it even a little more weird. Well, it does, it does and it doesn't because... In one respect, Bellator wouldn't put it on. Dana definitely wouldn't put it on. De La Hoya has the money and the connections to make it happen. Why, why would Chuck or, or Tito even come out of retirement? Do you think it's because of the money? Is that always the reason that, that, that we see this? Probably not the sole reason, but when someone offers you probably like, I'm, I would like to think they're probably getting multiple million dollars each for this fight, right? Plus pay-per-view percentages and so oh. forth. I would imagine right, this is going to be a very big payday for both of them. But second of all, it's it's to do probably with Tito's pride and, and with Chuck's pride. 
Who do you think is going to win this fight? You're, you're going with Tito? I don't I really know what I, to expect. I, I neither do I. I, I to be honest, I don't even I, I, I'll give I'll give my opinion, but I really don't even fucking want to. I don't even want to be a part of it. I really feel bad just even like saying it because I never would want, I'm a huge Chuck fan. I'm a huge Chuck fan, so don't get me wrong by me saying that, you know, the way he finished his retire or whatever. I'm a massive Chuck fan. I, I loved him. I grew up watching him. Um, I just don't want to see him get hurt, and I don't want to see anyone get hurt, including Tito. You can never write off Chuck. He's a great striker. He's a great MMA fighter, and he can knock anybody out. But I just think Tito is a little bit younger, stayed a bit more active, and I think he's just going to take him down and grind the shit out of him, to be honest. I mean, Chuck used to have one of the best takedown defense games in the world. he just stand up like a fucking magician. I just don't know if he has the strength and support system and energy system, lung capacity anymore to do that. And you know what? You make a good point. You don't want to see him get hurt. And another thing, like the MMA media, there's a lot of dirty MMA media out there that that is waiting to to put on uh, an ugly headline. Like this weekend, we just saw Randy Couture's son – Go in there, and then Bleacher Report released his son. Uh, father watches son get knocked out. It's just like, well, come on, guys. It's fucking ridiculous. But they're almost lucky, like, you, you know how it is in this sport anyway. Like, as soon as someone's doing good, there's a lot of haters just queuing up to say their little piece. And now, unfortunately, there's like hater journalists. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't be called journalists, in my opinion, because you know you're 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 a fucking fan uh, and, and you're a hater and you've set up a blog. Or now you've you've got a few fucking idiot other haters that follow you, and now you now you're a journalist. You, you ain't a journalist. You just report shit. Now, uh, Randy didn't go there to watch his son get knocked out. He went there to support his son's fight. Unfortunately, his son got knocked out. How how can you report he went there to knock him out? Do you know what I mean? Like it's just how you twist normal simplistic motions. Um, it's dirty. And there's people queuing up and dirty to to smash on this sport, and unfortunately. Chuck versus Tito happening is just helping them. Because you know if, God forbid, someone gets hurt, or in the best case scenario, it's just a shit fucking fight between two old guys, what's the report going to say? You know, it's just going to go on and on and on about people just pissing on the sport. And it's just going to cause waves across the board, right? I mean, listen, does Oscar De La Hoya give a fuck about MMA? No, he doesn't. He makes billions and billions of dollars from from boxing. He's only putting this on for one thing, and that's money. He has no compassion for MMA. He has no interest in it. It's all about money. Before I came on the show, I was at the bar getting some appetizers, obviously having a beer, sitting back, going through my notes, looking at you know what we were going to be talking about. And you know, on my way home, I was listening to a podcast. I'm not going to throw him under the bus. It's, it's actually a real popular podcast that's out there where these guys, they sit down, they watch fights and they discuss, you know, some, some past fights and rampage versus Rashad Evans came up. And mm -hmm. I heard one of these guys just really mouthing off about how he can't stand rampage and how he's, he was saying all these negative things about it. And you look at like the downloads that they get and it's like through the roof. Like yeah, it's so he, disrespectful. And the thing is with, with some of these podcasts out there, which is one of the real reasons I wanted to do one with you, is because I, I don't listen to these stuff. Right? I've seen a few of them out there. I'm not dropping any names. I've seen a few out there, and they're so popular. But they're almost popular because they just – rather than give their honest, true opinion, they give the opinion of the hater. They give the opinion of the fan – that doesn't like the sport. And there's more of those that, that, than do. So they're almost playing to the realm of talking shit. So if we talk shit, it's okay for you to talk shit. So all the shit talkers will then follow us and then we'll get popular and we'll get paid a ton of money. What they really lost the objective of a podcast or, of, or a journalist or a reporter is to give the facts. And facts, uh, an opinion doesn't erase facts. That's the bottom line. The fact of the matter is, Rampage is not a shit fighter. There's not a fighter in the UFC that's shit or fights professionally because that's what they do. If you don't like him, that's your opinion. That's not a fact. The fact of it is, the guy has made millions of dollars. He's worldwide renowned. He's beat some of the best, the best fighters in the world. He's lost some too. But you know what? That's fighting. If you don't want to lose, don't fucking fight. Simple. But do you think like... Uh, you got an opinion. Oh, he's shit. I can't stand him. I, yeah, you're right. You can't stand him. Doesn't mean he's shit. Just means you don't like him. 
So you can say, I don't like him, but you can't say he's a shit fighter. You can't. Yeah. And it rubs a lot of people the wrong way, especially the fighters or, or myself. When when you know what these fighters go through and the reality that, you know, what these headlines are going to do to them when they read them, it's just like... These fucking guys should know better because they're involved in the sport as well. It ain't like they're not involved in the sport. So we know what they say. We know they're a thing where they want to sit back and now want to be an armchair critic in a little studio. But the fact of the matter is they've been involved in the sport for years. So we know what they're saying. And they know deep down what they're saying. It's just for a reaction. It's just for people to comment on social media. It's just for the retweet. It's just to get popular. But then why are you listening to a fucking, you know, a podcast that's not true? And a lot of you these guys aren't in the fight game either. Like a lot of these guys just sit at home on their couch watching and giving shit opinions. And that's all they have. It's just – it's an untrained uh, idea of doing it. It's like me saying now, I want to do a podcast about race car driving. I'll just start one up. I watch <laughs> it on the weekend. I know fuck all about race car driving. I don't know enough about how how would I be educated enough to comment about race car? Well, he's shit. He went two seconds slower than the first guy. Well, that's obvious. He went two seconds slower. He's definitely not shit, though. He's still on a Daytona, isn't he? He's still a fucking amazing race car driver. What do I know about it? Do you know what I mean? So it, I just don't get the audacity to some of these guys that have no training in it. Just because you go to the gym once or twice a week or whatever, think that you've got an opinion that, that, that should count. I don't get it. But... That's the thing about this sport is, unfortunately, you know, for me, I just I've, I've disengaged from that side of the sport because I've been around a long time and and I was doing this before the Internet. I was doing this before social media um, and we didn't give a shit back then. We fought for ourselves. We trained for ourselves. Now there's these platforms. And of course, you've got to evolve with the sport. But I don't understand some of these guys as men. I don't get them. I don't understand. So for me, I never will understand. I'm not going to waste my energy trying to understand them. I just wish people wouldn't engage with them. Just let them fade and die off. They won't have a podcast if no fucker listens. Yeah, I've seen just, a lot of, of, of yeah, big fighters get they, – they engage with a lot of these trolls that are on Twitter or, or whatever, and it, it definitely gets under their skin. That's what they're doing though, right? What they're doing is they're engaging to them on social media, trying, begging – do they get a reply? Once they get a reply, what do they do? Bam. Talk about it straight on their podcast. Screenshot it. Instagram. <laughs> Facebook. So then, therefore, it starts a whole momentum. Oh, such and such said this to me. He talked mad to me. Do you know what I mean? Yep. And it just creates a whole conundrum of bullshit. And that's what they can repel it off and reflect off of and, and try to magnify it all off. And it's just what they're doing. It's just putting a law out there. It's like walking up to LeBron James in the street and, and insulting the guy for no apparent reason. Well, he punches you in the face. Now you hit the headlines, right? Because you're on the new LeBron James punched you. Yeah, I wish. Any man, if you walk, yeah, but that's what I'm saying to you. Any man would punch you if you said that to him. So they, But they, won't, they haven't got the balls to do it face-to-face. They'll do it on the social media platform. Yeah. They can repel off of it, and they can get more listeners and more followers from it. It's not reporting. It's not, and it's not actually giving an intelligent review of someone's performance or, or 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 the sport in general. We should be talking about a sport that we love, and every athlete that's in it, whether we like them or dislike them, which is a stupid thing to say because how can you dislike someone you've never met? Is beyond me. You can say, I don't like the way they fight. I don't like their style of fight. It doesn't suit me. They're a bit boring or they're crazy or whatever you want to say. But at the end of the day, you can't – it's just different. You know what I mean? You can't say, I don't like him. When did you I, meet him? I just don't understand because the reason why I follow this sport, the reason why I cover this sport, the reason why I've been in love with it my entire life is because it brings happiness to me, not because I see things in it that make me angry. You know what I mean? So it's just like – it's just nonsense reading all this stuff and, and knowing that these guys get paid for these headlines. It's a great interest, right? You, you're, you're an enthusiast of the sport. You like to watch it. You study it. And, and you give an, on a non-biased opinion and you report about that. And that's great. That's this clean cut down the line as you can give it, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to do this review because – I wanted that clean cut image that I have a lot of opinions personally over some of the athletes we talk about because I know them personally. But I'm not going to bring that to the platform because it's not what it's about. This is about them as athletes and what we discuss as athletes. And to be honest, they're all great. They're all amazing athletes, every single one of them. Otherwise, they wouldn't be on fucking TV in the first place getting paid millions of dollars, right? 
<laughs> so you just got to appreciate and be happy that you're a part of it in some circle or another. But to sit back and just talk crap about them just for the sake of it is, is mind-boggling to me. I don't know how these guys can call themselves men. So before we jump into the Ultimate Fighter Season 27 finale, well, really, UFC 226 uh, predictions between Steve A and DC, I want a quick take between, you know, what do you think about Dana making this headline statement of, I'm going to be making a really ballsy move lately inside the boxing scene with Zufa. Do you think that's going to be, be going through? Do you think that's going to be a success? What do you think his plan is here? Um, I think any time, every time they make, do, they make a decision to do something, it's to do with money. If he's going to make a boxing news of Zufa, it's going to be money. Um, and, and they always have a plan. And nothing's getting said without, oops, I said that. No, he mean to say it. He mean to say everything. <laughs> because he's a very, very intelligent businessman. And there's a business plan behind every model of release. It's just building hype towards the big moment. So it's not so much of a surprise. Um, I, I think it's fantastic. I mean, to be honest, I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about it because I think boxing needs it. I think MMA needs it. And I think that um, looking at what Dana did for MMA and Zuffa does that for boxing. And I think it's fantastic. And if it's a crossover for fighters to step from the UFC into boxing and boxing back into the UFC, I'm all for it because you know what? They're going to earn far more money like, like Connor did than they would in MMA. And they deserve more money. And if they're talented enough to step back and forth, then why shouldn't they? You know, I'm, I'm interested to see if Mayweather has anything to do with any of this because we know that he's training with T. Wood. So we'll see as, as the days and the weeks go on. But let's move forward to the Ultimate Fighter Season 27 slash UFC 226 predictions as we get towards the end of today's show. I think it's really important to discuss this week because there, there's so much going on. There's so many um, amazing fights on this card between Stipe and Cormier. I spoke to Resendo Sanchez, uh, and he was telling me, man, he was like, I don't think this fight's going to go the distance. What do you think, no. James? I don't think it'll go the distance. I mean, I'm a big fan of both fighters. I think Stipe is too much for DC. Um, and I only say that because until I watched DC against John Jones, I never thought I would have saw the DC I did, the frustrated DC, the out technical wise. Because I never saw that before until John Jones showed it. You know, the frustration I saw in DC's performances. DC, in my opinion, is one of the pound for pound best fighters in the world. And as heavyweight, I thought he's better as a heavyweight than he is as a light heavyweight, to be honest. I think that weight cut really has a problem with him because you can tell by his diet. I think that really puts a lot of stress on his body. He doesn't like to cut the weight. Um, but after watching Stipe recently, that guy is calm, cool, collective, not intimidated by anybody. He lives up to the big picture of the hype. Yeah, he's not the big talker. He's not the big flamboyant superstar heavyweight. What he is, pound for pound, one of the best fighters in the world. And every time he goes out and fights, he he he, he just he, he just uh, you know when I saw him against Naganu, when I saw him against Alistair, you know when he fought Alistair, Alistair rocked the shit out of him. And, I mean, he regained consciousness, <laughs> pulled his stuff back up, sucked his balls up, got up and beat the crap out of Alistair. You know, and i tell you what, that is that is a serious, serious achievement. I've been hit by Alistair, <laughs> and I, wouldn't, I, would, I don't think I could get up and do what he did. Um, that's an absolute monster. And he's just done it time and time again. I mean, uh, don't forget, look at the look at the, the, the hype train that was behind Nagano when he fought Stipe. UFC had pretty much announced that Nagano was going to be the heavyweight champion. Yeah, yeah, they did. And he went out there and just sucked it up, didn't fight back publicly, didn't say mm -hmm. nothing, just beat the living shit out of him. <laughs> Picked him up, slammed him, beat him up, got up, beat him up, didn't, you know, against a really big, strong, hyped up Nagano. He just beat the piss out of him. And I remember uh, that press conference when, you know, D, I mean, uh, when Dana was standing there pretty much announcing him as the champion, like this guy hits with 48,000 horsepower or whatever. And you got Stipe sitting there and then Ningano looks over. He's like, you're scared, Stipe. And Stipe's just like, whatever. And at the time, I was like, you know what? He's got to be a little scared. He went in there calm, cool, collected, just like he did against Verdum, Overeem, and all these other guys. And he was able to put it, put all, connect all the dots and really prove that he's one of the best. The only person I think that could in my opinion, who could really test Stipe. And that's when he was at his best. And I haven't seen him at his best since he fought Junior Santos. That's Cain Velasquez. Ooh. 
And that's now we're going to see a little bit of that this week because DC trades with him. Yeah, that's the only man I would imagine. Though, I was ringside when he fought the Santos twice. And that's the only man when he was at his highest level performance, when he was peaking without the injuries, when I saw him beat up um, um, uh, fucking Brock Lesnar. Brock Lesnar. The Santos. When I saw those performances, that was the best Cain Velasquez I'd ever seen. The best punches. His boxing looked fantastic. His work rate is absolutely immense. That's the best Cain I've ever seen. He's the only man, in my opinion, um, that right now could come back and, and challenge Stipe. I don't think DC's strong enough. I don't think he's got the all-round game. And now we've seen DC break when he fought John Jones on numerous occasions. That really showed a lot of DC's weak side. Do you know what I mean? He's tried to cover it up with some shit talking back about John Jones, but it's just made him look a little bit more insecure. Well, here's here's the thing with what you were just saying about Cain Velasquez. You know, he looked great in his last fight too when he took a little time off when he appeared at UFC 200 against Travis Brown. I mean, he came out with like a spinning kick. Or okay, at, not, yeah, I mean, a guy that's six foot eight. Yeah, you know, Cain is not even what six foot one, six foot. He just done it, you know. I mean, listen, Kane, in my opinion, is probably one of the best heavyweights of all time. Um, I mean, I don't know anyone who can outwork the guy. He's got hands that are probably the, one of the best boxing hands in MMA. I mean, he can kick. Look at his back kick against Brown. He's got a great wrestling and ground game. His ground and pound is phenomenal. He will outwork anybody I've ever seen in the ring. So I, I don't know who can beat him in that realm. Him and Stipe are here and here, in my opinion. But he's, he's not ready yet. I mean, he's injury after injury. At AKA, they spar so much. I believe that AKA took him to that level, but also they've killed that level. That's why Dana, he may not say it, but he hates fucking AKA, right? <laughs> he goes there and shows his face, but he fucking can't stand them because everyone's injured. They spar way too much. They've allowed each other just to get fucking crippled in the gym. And that's what happened with Kane. He got, you know, he's just got injury after injury after injury, way too much sparring, going way too hard. And, and, and also a little bit with DC. I mean, they, DC's probably gave his best performance at the AK headquarters. I wouldn't be surprised. You also have Habib there. You have Luke Rock. You have all these monsters trading there. And yeah, uh, reports. Look at, the, look, look at Luke Ross, the, uh Luke. Uh, his performance haven't been the greatest either since then. Also, injury after injury yet again, and and, and just having that same that same mentality in the gym of where they're just out there mm. sparring all the time, and just too much injury prevention. The older they get, the more injuries are coming their way. I mean, I've trained at AKA in Thailand, and I was almost laughing that there's no coach in there. <laughs> they just spar every morning. That's it. Stand up sparring. Ground sparring, stand up sparring Monday, Wednesday, Friday, ground sparring Tuesday, Thursday. No coaching, no technique, I, nothing, just spar. I've heard a lot of fighters come out and say, they're like, you know, this day and age, we, we're learning so much more about fighting and not to do hard sparring as much yeah. as we used to back in the day. Yeah, and, and this is what they're still in bed. I mean, AKA is just a cheap copy of AKA um, in, in San Diego. San Diego, I'm sure there, there's a lot more technical work because they've actually created and made killers. AKA in Thailand hasn't done that. It's just cheap copy of the name. But when I was there, it was just sparring every day. It was just, I mean, it was just ridiculous. It was just, even if it wasn't high level sparring, because there's not that many high level guys there. There was, a, Amir was there at the time. He was a very high level heavyweight. And me and him were having wars every day. And we, me and him got to an agreement in the end of saying like, we're rocking each other's heads off every single day. Like for weeks. Like we said, like, are we going to take this down at some point or are we going to, going to keep this up and just keep doing it for our ego? And I could see then the mentality of, well, this is what we do at AKA. This is what we do. And that's what I heard. And I was like, fuck, if that's what they do in America, no wonder why Kane's always injured. No wonder why there was always injuries there. You know, it's just not healthy. And it's not also good for fighters to not learn. So going back onto it, I think Stipe is a bit too much for, for, for DC right now. And you but, see it. You can never write him off, right? You see it ending before the fifth? I think DC puts him away in three. Um, I think C-Bank. Stipe puts DC away in three. Yeah, I, I could see something similar going down there. Also, another huge heavyweight fight going down, guys. We have Francis Ngannou going up against Derek Lewis. Have you seen any of these? Have you seen uh, any of Derek Lewis before in the past? What he's been able to get done? 
Yeah, Derek is it, it has got he got heavy hands, right? I mean, the guys are just a big monster. Um, same as I think it's a great fight. I mean, it's fifty fifty. I think Niganu has a better all round game than Derek, to be honest. As in the fact of uh, he boxes better, he has, but he has a better chin and he can hit harder. I think Derek has better wrestling than Niganu. Um, but I don't think his boxing is as good, and I don't think, and, he's, and I don't think his chin is as good. If Derek can play the game plan like Stipe did, box him, shoot on him, keep him down, wear him down, I think Derek wins that fight. But if he doesn't, he tries to go out there and fight like toe for toe and play the guy on his game. I think he's going to get knocked out inside two rounds. I mean, we've seen Derek Lewis face adversity. Look at him in that Travis Brown fight when Travis was piecing him up in round one. We're like, oh shit, Travis yeah, is coming you know back. Know something? There's facing adversity. Like Travis is a strong, powerful. Does you don't face adversity against Nagano. You're doing okay, and then the guy just knocks you and puts you asleep. <laughs> yeah, like true. you think you're doing it right, and then he just lands. And when he lands, it's like that left uppercut from his. He pulls it like his left hand is down. He pulls it from his waist, and once he hits you with it, it's just you don't even see it coming. It's just a bullet, right? Yeah, well, and that's the thing. I don't think he's going to face adversity against Nagano. I think Derek's going to have look like on paper he's having his way, and then I just think Nagano pulls it out of the bag and just takes his head off. Oh, man, that, I mean, that's got to excite any MMA fan out there to want to know what's going to happen in this fight. Mm -hmm. Especially, I mean, when's the last time you've seen the heavyweight division this exciting with with some new younger faces? No, oh, it's amazing right now, and that's what I'm saying. It's so exciting right now, and that's why it's a shame, really, on one side that the Ultimate Fighter is finishing because we haven't had a really a good heavyweight season the Ultimate Fighter in so long, you know. And to get a new load of fresh faces come through with the heavyweight and refresh it and just keep it young and vibrant and and keep it moving, I think it'd be fantastic. But it's just a shame it's coming to an end. But you know, there's always going to be new people being hired. There's always going to be a new roster coming in. So you never say never, right? But I just think, uh, yeah, it's just very exciting right now. It's great fights. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm excited as a fan to sit back and watch. Before we end today's show, I really quickly, because we were just talking about Kane and with this whole Stipe versus DC thing, it's a little confusing as to what's next if Stipe wins. I mean, do you think Kane can kind of leapfrog in front of people and get the next title shot since he was the former champ? I think it's stupid if they do. I mean, Kane would love to, I'm sure, but I think on a, on a, on a downside, I think he should come back and fight number two, number three. I'd, like to, see him, I'd like to see him fight Alistair. Yeah, I was about to say it was about to be Overeem or Verdum, I believe it's like two or three, uh, I believe. Or, or even, you know, look at... Um, I, I'm really terrible. I'm sorry. I forget his name. Who just beat Alistair. Uh, Francis, right? Francis Ngannou no, just beat Alistair. No, no, Francis had been beaten before, but he just fought the young guy. Um, uh, Tabera. Mercy yeah, no, 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 no. Um, who did he just fight just recently? There, I got it right here. I don't know why I'm drawing a blank. Oh, C uh, Curtis Blades. Curtis Blades. Yeah. He should fight Curtis Blades. Both good wrestlers. It's a great test for Blades. It's a great comeback fight for um, Kane to see where he's at. Beat Curtis and step in and, and, and take on Stipe. You know, that's not a bad idea either. And, uh, you know, we're going to have to wait and find out. I think that's just a, a smarter test to see where he's... I mean, being out and having the surgery he's had is no joke. And I'm sure he's been active in the gym, but it's not the same. Well, here's the thing. Uh, Rosendo told us on the show that, uh, this week he was like, I can't tell you when Kane's coming back, but it's going to be soon. And then as I'm seeing some headlines come out, it looks like he's going to be returning before the end of the year. So, you know, there's there's some exciting matchups to look forward to at heavyweight. Yeah, I mean, there's some great fights coming. I mean, Connor's coming back at the end of the year. There's going to be some great fights coming. There's a lot of announcements to be made. So I'm sure there's going to be some great fights coming up. And it's exciting times right now in the UFC. It's really exciting. And for the fans out there before Christmas, you're always going to have that big Christmas, you know, Boxing Day, uh, the day after Christmas spectacular right there's always gonna be a big one before the new year mm. so uh yeah there's some really exciting fights coming i mean i know i'm busy before the end of the year so i've got my shit going on but uh i've got a lot of fights coming up which is great but i mean for the ufc it is awesome it is really cool yeah it feels like christmas once again for adults or mma fans this week and international fight we can see these young up-and-comers on the season ultimate fighter and how excited they are to be there and, and, and meet some of the other fighters and kind of feel like they're a part of the UFC for the first time. It's really exciting to see once again. Before we uh, end today's show really quick, 
James, uh, who have you been having in the gym recently? I've been seeing some some huge names that you've been uh, bringing in over there to your uh, gym. Well, yeah, well, my, my gym is freshly. We just opened a month ago, McSweeney's Martial Arts down in Patong Beach, um, inside Maximum Fitness Gym. It's a big gym on, on Patong Beach. And uh, I was on a movie. I did a movie um, six weeks ago in Malaysia. And um, the number one actor and superstar is a guy called Zul Arif. And uh, he's huge. He's like the Jason Stratham of England, you know what I mean, in Asia. That he does all the action stuff. He's a part of the military movies. And he does love stories too. But he was my, he was my main character in the movie. And I was pretty much the baddie. And uh, we have a big fight scene and so forth in the movie. And as uh, soon as we finished, he took a couple of days off. And he'd come over and spent a couple of weeks at my gym training with me, uh, learning. To, he never trained any kind of MMA or Muay Thai before. And, um, you know, what an athlete. The guy just picked it up nonstop. So um, I'm going to speak to him next week, and we're going to get him on the show. That would and be I awesome. Get, I want to get his opinion on, um, you know, on as an outsider just looking at the events of um, being a fan of MMA, getting to work with me at the gym, and also getting his opinion on how – the acting lifestyle, how many more MMA movies are coming apparent, and I want to see his opinion from an actor's role, um, you know, on, on that transition and what he feels about it. Um, I know he's definitely found a new love for the sport because he was like hooked. He, at seven o'clock in the morning, he was at the gym before me. <laughs> so, uh, it was really cool. I mean, the guy's got millions and millions of fans on social media. Um, my social media has really flown up by thousands of followers in the last week or so off the back of him just posting a few things. So it'd be great to get his opinion. And also in Malaysia, there's such a big following in MMA right now with 1FC being there and, and having a lot of shows over there. There's the Malaysian invasion and the amateur scenes have come out, a lot of MMA gyms. So it'd be great to get his opinion and, and, and see um, on, on what he thinks uh, of uh, MMA as, as a trained professional actor. I mean, the guy is followed by millions and millions of people, so it's going to be uh, pretty cool to see his opinion on this and get him on the show. James, last but not least, where can people find you on social media? McSweeney MMA? McSweeney MMA on Instagram and uh, James McSweeney on Facebook, you know, as normal. And you can follow my gym, McSweeney's Martial Arts. So um, we're still looking for our name, right? We've yes. got to everyone come flooding all these names in for our show, which was fantastic. We've ironed down to the last few. But uh, we still haven't concreted it yet. So I think we'll do one more week or one more show. Guys, don't be shy. Give us your give us your opinions on our name. We need a good name. People have come up with Evil McSweeney and uh, uh, Sledgehammer Diaz. And it just flood us as many as you can. You're not going to be sure. We'll pick out the best. I think we should do is run a little competition where we pick out like the top three. And the winner, the one we choose, gets a, a signed uh, picture for us. Or even we could bring them on the show as a guest. I like Which that idea. You know what I mean? And we can get them to um, – so whoever picks – whoever sends us in, in and we choose your one, we could bring you on as a guest and give your opinion about MMA and how uh, how you feel about it. And also the thank you for giving us the name of our event and our show and our podcast. And you know what, James? It's, it's even funnier because not only are some of these people helping us with names, but they're sending us logos and, and everything. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's really cool to see uh, – See the fans react to uh, our, our very first episode. And here's number two. Yeah, well, now we've got to hit number one. We want to make sure this one gets the best download. Not number two downloads. We want the best download. So this one has to hit it. So let's whack it out there, guys. Repost it and send it to your friends, please. Guys, last but not least, behave yourselves. White knuckles to the end. We'll see you next time. See you soon. Oof. Thanks, James. Have a good night, brother. I hope you heal up. See you soon. Bye, mate. Later. Guys, make sure to subscribe down below here on the podcast. You can find us on Podbean, Stitcher, Podomatic, iTunes, and YouTube. And now I am happy to say you can find this podcast on Spotify. So for all you guys out there that love listening to music at the gym, now you don't have to download a podcast app. Now you don't have to leave the application. If you're on Spotify or listen to Drake's new album or listen to... Uh, hate breed, whatever you're into. All you have to do is go to the search button and search Pure Evil MMA. Bam, right there. We have interviews every week. Me and James McSweeney's podcast is on there as well. Or subscribe to our YouTube page, which is not on the Pure Evil MMA channel. It is actually on its own page on YouTube. We do not have a name for the show yet, so the name is under James McSweeney vs. Evil. Guys, have a great weekend. It is officially International Fight Week. Gave yourselves.